As we begin our service, we acknowledge that the beloved church building, which we all long to attend once again, is built on the traditional lands of the Western Abnaki people who have stewarded these lands and waters for generations. I am Sarah Franklin, member of the Worship and Arts Committee, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this virtual service. Uh, Reverend Joan is on study break at this time, so Virtus Robinson, our interim minister, is steering the worship today. For over 150 years, the Unitarian Church of Montpelier has been a sanctuary for those seeking spiritual uh, wisdom and sustenance and for actual peace and justice in this world. Whether you are a newcomer or a longtime member, we're so glad that you are with us this morning. Again, a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Let us now enter more deeply into our time of worship with our prelude. Liz Benjamin, and I write poetry sometimes, um, but I don't really know where the poems come from. And that's what this poem is about. Ars Poetica. It grabs me as I dust the cluttered coffee table, shifting New Yorkers and yesterday's news. As I scrub the spaghetti sauce pot, tomato red water, twirling down the drain. As I scoop cat food equally into two cobalt porcelain bowls. As I watch golden light peak over the East Mountains. As I warm my fingers on the green umbrellas on the mug from Victoria. It grabs me by the wisps of hair beside my ears by the multicolored threads on my sweater's fraying cuffs, by the instep of my purple sock. It rings my wrist with pale strings of nouns and bright bangles of sparkling verbs until I am as tied up and tied down as Gulliver by the Lilliputians. And yes, I cry, yes, poem. Our opening song is Gather the Spirit, number 347, if, you're, if you have a gray hymnal handy, um, but we will also have the lyrics posted here. Please join me as we sing together, Gather the Spirit by Jim Scott. Once again.
Let us now light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I invite you now to light a chalice at home if you have one nearby. We light this flame, enduring symbol of our collective commitment to lead with truth and compassion. Now, please join us now in saying these words of affirmation adapted from L. Griswold Williams in unison. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service its prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine, thus do we covenant. As I was thinking about our theme of imagination this month in our new calendar year, I was remembering myself as a child, as a student, as a graduate of design school, as a parent, as an art educator, and as a member of this congregation for 25 years. I kept coming back to nature and its connection with my own imagination. So I created a series of paintings and paired words with them, and I share them with you today. Thanks for watching. Imagination. Written and illustrated by Beth Damon. What sparks your imagination? Imagination, let's explore together. Imagination takes courage. Imagination is a journey into the unknown. Imagination is dreaming about what is possible. Imagination is creativity's best friend. Imagination is always there when you need it. Imagination is your rescue in the stormy seas. Imagination is a peaceful time alone. Imagination is listening. Imagination frees and liberates your mind. Imagination helps you to understand and overcome differences. Imagination is a blossoming of ideas. Imagination is possibility and hope. Your imagination is uniquely your very own. What sparks your imagination? The end. <laughs>
All right. So if we can enter into a posture of prayer and meditation, feel free to close your eyes, sit up in a meditative position, feeling grounded and connected to the spirit. You can cover your heart with your hands. As I read a meditation for a new year adapted from the words of the Reverend Amanda Papai. My friends, we have arrived. We are here in this new year. We have crossed the boundary of time into the new year with all of its resolutions and plans and schedules ahead of us. Let us pause for just a moment before we move boldly onward. Let us pause to hear the breathing of those who are around us. Pause to feel the presence of those who are on this call. Those who have joined us on their computers, on their tablets, on their phones, connected through Wi-Fi, cell phone towers and power lines. Let us invite the spirit of our lives to join us wherever we are right now and feel the presence surrounding us and in our hearts to know this presence is in our lives. Let us pause to consider the trees, their branches stripped bare, but their elegant architecture is on display. Let us pause to feel the spirit of life and love that ties us together that winds its way through our very bones and settles in our hearts. Before we move forward, armed with resolutions that will shortly be forgotten in the day-to-day -day life of living in the midst of great loss and suffering, in the midst of great sacrifices, in the midst of a time of uncertainty like none other, in a time of fear, let us notice what it mean, that it remains every year and every day what exists beyond schedules and months, beyond time, beyond fear. This welcomes us to life. It welcomes us to joy. It welcomes us to happiness. It welcomes us to peace. We are open to freedom. We are open to justice and we are open to love. Not just the start of this new year, but every single day of our lives. Let this be the answer. Amen. And blessed be. And now a chance to hear from another one of our stalwarts who's ordinarily giving us music, but today is also going to give us some words that she wrote some long time ago, I believe. So Eliza, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, December of, of 2020 was the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. And I remember that I'd written a piece um, 22 years ago called Ode to Joyce. So I dug it up and <clears throat> was surprised to find that it also referenced the year 2020 with some dire predictions, though not the ones that actually happened. So here it is, Ode to Joy, 1998. We are driving home at the end of the day. My daughter, Pan Pan, my four-year-old daughter, Pan Pan, is in the back concentrating on untying her shoes. I seize the opportunity to listen to all things considered. The governor of some state, Georgia maybe, proposes that all newborns listen to classical music. A recent scientific study concludes that the brain exposed to music early on will later function in abstract terms with greater facility. The governor prefers country western, but he thinks that classical music will be more soothing. Ode to Joy, for example, should be introduced at birth, 
the government, he says, will distribute tapes. I think Ode to Joy is many things, but I do not think it is soothing. Does he not realize it's the final movement of Beethoven's final Ninth Symphony, the theme to a set of variations with full chorus and orchestra and every emotion under the sun? I snicker, then feel snobbish. The governor also encourages piano lessons. IQ scores apparently rise significantly in young piano students for reasons that are being vigorously researched. I wonder briefly about nature versus nurture. I make my living as a musician, but so far my Chinese-born daughter shuns the piano. I recall my early lessons and the simple arrangement of Ode to Joy in Book One. The melody begins to play in my head. Pan Pan has succeeded in taking off her shoes. She wants me to put them on again. I can't. I'm going 80 miles an hour, I say distractedly. She holds up a shoe, toe pointing down, sole toward me, and asks which foot it goes on. My brain is not as agile with spatial relationships as it used to be. I have to glance back three times before I can tell her, and by that time she has lost interest. NPR is already well into a new piece. Scientists have discovered something crucial about aging. They have located the whatever it is that turns on or turns off the gene that allows for endless division of the cell, or something. I turn up the volume slightly. I am 50, Pan Pan is 4. There are benefits to older parenting, but life expectancy is not one of them. Now she wants to play the balloon game. She asks for a balloon, then pretends to eat the balloon that I pretend to give her. Pop, chomp, she says, and asks for a different color. She invented this game herself. I'm afraid I'll scream if I have to play the balloon game. I'm not a good mother. There is a really interesting story on, I say. It's about growing old and growing up, I quickly add. I hope this phrase will impress her, but it doesn't. The story, what little I can catch of it, tantalizes. Techniques are on the distant horizon to retard the aging process. Pop, chomp, insists Pan Pan from the back seat. We all might live for centuries someday. Obviously, there are implications. What about population growth? What about menopause? Another topic that interests me strangely. Shouldn't we be doing better with the time we already have instead of trying to tack on more? I wonder when the techniques will be available, just out of curiosity, but I've missed that part of the story. News headlines now. Another village has been slaughtered, ditches filled with mutilated bodies. Yeltsin has dismissed his entire government. The National Endowment for the Arts might be dissolved. The current round of Allied bombing is not having the desired effect. Tobacco companies are eyeing the Asian markets. The ice cap is melting, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing, we can do about it. Chomp, says Pan Pan again, interrupting the next news item. Something will end in the year 2020. Social Security, Medicare, funding for education. With some difficulty, the effects of my early piano lessons have evidently worn off. I calculate that I'll be 72 when whatever it is that will end ends. Pan Pan will be 26. She clamors now. Pink, green. I pretend to blow up two balloons. Whoosh, whoosh. Then I spend some time feeling frantic about jobs and schooling and financial insecurity and about the year 2020 and all the terrible turns of events and all that will have run out of and all that is already lost. Soon I find that I've become quite depressed. Maybe I should teach her piano, even if she box, while there is still time. The news is over. Finally. My mind should be on the highway we're hurtling down, but thanks to the governor of Georgia or whatever state it is, I'm still hearing Beethoven's Ode to Joy. I realize I've been hearing it all along, and now I can't get it out of my head. I've reached the part where the crescendos of a zillion voices and a zillion instruments crash into silence. Silence, then a distant bass drum, and here they come triangles and piccolos with their own variation. Here they come, skipping gaily to a new beat, ridiculously hopeful, absurdly beautiful. It's enough to make you cry. I meet Pan Pan's dark eyes, 
in the rear view mirror. Us too, the new little instrument seemed to say. Us too. They approach and then they take up the tune, lightening it, shining it, before they're swept up and away and into the music of everything else. We're going to be hearing this morning from um, two other poets, three other poets. Um, first, Kristen Glaser has a couple poems, I think, that the congregation will be especially interested in. Kristen? Kristen Glaser, and I'm gonna be reading some pieces that I wrote for the poetry class at the Senior Center. Pandemic Sunday Church, written in September. I sit on my bed, zoom in for Unitarian Church. Laptop on my thighs, I smile at the greetings of my community in the chat box. Voice reedy, I sing along with the recorded hymn. Odd to be singing alone in my sunlit bedroom. Our young minister, Rev. Jones' face and shoulders fill the 13-inch computer screen. From her sanctuary, she preaches that fall is a time of self-examination, particularly this fall. I become aware of how intimate I am with her. I'm not down in the pew, and she is not up in the pulpit. Her luminous face is right in my lap. But she can't see me. This one-sided closeness feels enjoyable, but also uncomfortable. I move the computer off to the side table. And then back in April, I wrote, Amazed Gratitude. How do I deserve this? After years of wishing for a tribe, my own herd of elephants, it took this pandemic for me to get it in my bones that I live in the middle of a herd. I'm an aging matriarch elephant in our cul-de-sac neighborhood where the younger females are taking the lead. The grocery shop for the elders text, going to Shaw's, need anything? Out my window, I see them gathering with the young ones on the flat to supervise biking, playing four square. From my porch, I call out safe distance as they lean out their car windows. We want contact. Family privacy rules are bent. I host almost daily Qigong exercise on the street with elders. We are masked, six feet apart. Sometimes only one, sometimes five elephants communing, swaying our arms, stamping our feet, keeping our blood moving. And with my larger herd of family, friends, Unitarian Church, who I can't reach with direct rumblings, but can reach with a computer, I receive and send love vibrations floating over the miles. I can feel it in my bones. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> and I think we're going to hear one more poem from Liz now. We've heard her beautiful Ars Poetica, and perhaps she'll tell us what brought her this poem. Thank you, Liz. This poem is called Wild Things. And it starts with my indoor cats, but then it moves outside. Skidding on the winking wide planked maroon floors, the cats prowl and pounce, tail switching, a panther and a tiger. I pull on my boots, bang shut both front doors. The pond stretches away, rippled or frozen, ringed and filled with green or gold or sparkles. The waterfalls splash or freeze, white blankets, blue tangles. Trees shimmer around in the water or pencil still shadows on the snow. Out back, I tightrope walk on the deer trail through the black, many greened trees. I breathe and the woods breathe silently back until a sudden raucous roar of wind knocks the branches, drives the snowflakes, shivers the leaves, another wild thing. 
Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you. And last, I'm going to read two poems to you. The first one is one that I wrote about the weather. This I wrote, this was October weather, one particular day of great variety. What did the day say? Well, let me tell you. She began with good morning, an exclamation, of course, and then she burbled on as she does, spreading sunshine, blue skies, white clouds all over our mountains. But she didn't limit herself to trite monochromes. Instead, she drew from her capacious closet gossamer gray fog that she draped lightly above our valleys and rivers, whisked into the hollows, above rocks and rills, a promising beginning. We all quieted down. Noon saw a cloud cover thickening. And drought struck as we'd been, we began to chant, rain, rain, yes, rain, please. And that's what she brought. Perfectly perpendicular precipitation. Lord knows we needed it. So no one complained when it continued, soft, straight, gentle, slicking streets and walks, shining up the last roses, brightening the orangey yellows, the only colors left to us this dry year. By the time night approached, day had done her duty, shown us our wealth in possibilities and variations, recalled us to hope without vowing certainty. She greeted night cheerily and just a bit flirtatiously as she enjoys doing, toying with his dark moods, saying, I've worn them up for you, big boy. They're all yours now, night. Night now. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other poem I'd like to read to you is one that I wrote really in response to a, a question from a friend. She said, you don't talk about your family. Tell me a little bit about them. And my friend Tammy said, oh, I think when she heard this poem, you should call it Planets. Saturn first, my older sister, with her rings of caring concern, showed how we were meant to do things. Forks on the left, knives on the right, always napkin rings. Hospital corners made our beds tidier. Library books were stacked, not strewn. Homework first. To get A's, we needed scholarships. College wasn't enough. Why not Harvard grad school? Forever Jupiter, my older brother, at play in the wet grass, while the clouds rolled and thunder boomed, warm rain pelting us as we ran, shrieking, feet slithering in mud, mud streaking our hands, wiping muddy fingers in each other's hair, lessons in joy. Learning the word infinity, how beyond our backyard fence, there was more beyond always another beyond the beyond. Later came Mercury, dimpled little sister, quick circler round my mother. When I was a big girl now, 
helping with the bassinet, the diapers, then pushing the pram, reciting the rhymes, taking her to kindergarten, sharing jump rope and jacks, jokes and bruises. And for heaven's sake, she should go to Girls High better than Lincoln. Check out this magazine. It shows how to plan a college wardrobe. Yes, plan. Of course, my mother was earth to me. So brave, so clever. She could repair most anything with a hairpin or a button hook, a kiss or a cookie. She smiled scolded, sang to, warned us. My father, tall as the sky in his navy whites, whistled while we waited for the train to take him to war. How long that war lasted before he came back with all the warmth we had so wanted. Thank you. And now I invite you to sing our closing song, which as, as in the other song, Gather the Spirit, you will hear your own voices from Earlier before the pandemic, we have recordings of the wonderful congregation singing. And come and go with me um, if you have your teal hymnal is number 1018. And it is an African-American spiritual. And as many of you know, these powerful songs were handed down orally by people who uh, struggled in terrible circumstances, people who were enslaved, and yet they knew the power of community, the power of lifting up the group voice. Um, many of these songs have layers of meaning. Um, hope for the future, hope for a better life in the afterworld, uh, courage for the present, um, and often hidden layers and messages to each other about um, how to get away and how to come and go with me to that promised land. So. As always, we sing these songs with great respect, um, knowing of the powerful struggles that are behind this music and knowing that people still struggle today for a better world. Um, and yet we sing in joy and community. So I'm gonna invite you to rise if you want to, right where you are so that we can sing with even more power. Come and go with me and clap a little and dance a little if you like. Up.
So as we draw the service to our close, we extinguish the chalice and carry within each of us its healing flame and the warmth of community and the spark of hope into the days and weeks ahead. As we do this, let's join in saying the mission statement of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need, and protect the earth, our home. As we go forth into this new year with our celebrations, I know I celebrated at home here, and I think I, think I slept through the new year the first time ever. <laughs> but I like to offer a blessing um, adapted from the words of Susan Van Dresser. Let us go forth with the magic of imagination by which we know one another and learn the lives of eras gone by. Let us go forth with the magic of creation by which we build the world of our soul and teach its wisdom to others young and old. Let us go forth with the magic of our lives together, holding and shaping by the movement of breath from heart to lung, all new life that is to come. Go now in peace. Go now with magic in your fingertips, touching this world with life. May it be so. Blessed be Ashe. And Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs>